Good morning, everybody. It's uh, good to be here. I first want to acknowledge the Coast Salish territory we're on and, and um, say hello to all the elders, chiefs, health leaders, and partners that are here today. I um, have an opportunity to, um, to talk about the work that's been happening primarily since last Gathering Wisdom uh, as, as it relates to the organization, the, what used to be the First Nations Health Society. So I'm just wondering about the PowerPoint and uh, when it pops up. There it goes. So um, we've had lots of different um, analogies about how we look at the work that's been in front of us. And um, one of the ones that I recall and I think is really true now in terms of the amount of information that we're dealing with, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. And, and it really becomes challenging when we look at the work and the complexity of um, what's in front of us around building the First Nations Health Authority. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about some of that. So the presentation, we'll, we'll look at these four areas, um, looking at some of the mechanics around the transition pieces, talking about some of our priorities through transition, the uh, partnership piece, uh, really see this as um, what we're building is, is, is the ability to deliver what Health Canada does through FINI, but, but a bunch of more other things. So that's the plus plus. Um, so the creating of the First Nations Health Authority, we'll talk a bit about that in detail around some of the things that are happening that are um, making some of this um, sometimes good work and sometimes challenging work. I know you've all seen this slide many, many times and it's um, something that I know Grand Chief Kelly talked about yesterday and others have been talking about um, over the years. And it really, I think, in my mind, um, always is a reminder of where we've come from and the work that's been done. And that the, um, the work up until the signing of the framework agreement was guided and directed by political accords that set out how things were supposed to happen. Um, starting with the, um, uh, the creation of the Leadership Council way back in 2005 and how that was a, a real sort of facilitation of, of the changes that we see today with the signing of the Transform Change Accord in, in 2005 and, and the health plans that have flown out of that. So we just want to always make sure we, we understand the context in which the work is taking place. This picture here I think is really important um, and, and I know we've talked a bit about it but we're really trying to remind ourselves of the things that we've done to date. So talking about the political agreements and the work. Uh, the First Nations Health Society uh, was created over, just over three years ago and it was identified as the operational arm of the First Nations Health Council. And so during that time, a lot of the focus that we had in the growth and development of that organization was, was really around implementing the health plans that we had in place. So at that point in time, what we looked at it, it was about um, a couple of things. Supporting the engagement process with First Nations communities. And it started with hubs in the early days and then as the governance work picked up, it focused on how can we support the Health Council and the regional caucus processes. And now we're at the point where the Council, as mentioned, they're looking at an alignment of hubs with the regional caucus process, the potential creation of regional offices, and a whole system of engagement that, um, from a health perspective, has never existed in the past, but I think is also an engagement process that can help us in many areas in dealing with the social determinants of health as well, if First Nations choose to go that way. So that was a big focus of our work as the First Nations Health Society moving forward. And it will continue to be an important part of what the First Nations Health Authority will need to ensure is in place and provide support to based on the uh, leadership in the regions and the Health Council overall. The work that we identify in the middle is transition. And in a lot of ways, that's the work that started after, um, after April, sorry, October, um, October of 20, 2011. It was interesting to also be very clear what's meant by what are we transferring. And so what we are actually transferring when we think about it is the Finney operations in BC region. But we're getting more than that. We're actually getting the portion of the headquarters function that supports the regional office in British Columbia. And so when you sort of think about how it works, the, um, the regional office I like to describe as the arms and legs of what headquarters does and, and decides or directs to do. The um, um, comments have often been made about how, you know, the people in Ottawa don't know what's best for us. And so it's that um, strategic level of thinking and planning that capacity is part of what's coming over. Now that strategic level of thinking and planning goes far beyond just programs and services. 
It also affects um, the actual corporate infrastructure that supports the Fini regional operations. So the Fini BC regional operations itself doesn't take care of its corporate services. It does so through a different department or, or different arrangements within the federal government. So we actually have Health Canada has a, a BC office for the regional director general who runs the corporate services that provide support to the Fini regional operations. So we get a portion of that as well. And so it's, it's sometimes um, easier to think about we're taking on BC, Fini, uh, Fini, BC region. But when you start adding those extra pieces and we're starting to take parts of the other parts of the federal government, either in headquarters or in BC region, it adds a layer of complexity to it. That's part of where the, um, the fire hose issue comes into play. So the role of uh, the First Nations Health um, or the organization that we have now, the role of the First Nations Health Authority is, is evolving different to what the role of the First Nations Health Society was. And we talked about the Health Society being created as the operational arm of the First Nations Health Council. As we evolve into the Health Authority, we have to consider the notion of taking on service responsibility. So when the transfer is complete, the First Nations Health Authority will have the service responsibilities that still now today rest and remain with, with Health Canada through the Finney Regional Office and the headquarters folks. So we're in a transition to move that way. And I think that um, the discussion around the political oversight role of the First Nations Health Council and the role that it's doing in relation to gathering wisdom and, and the direction that come out of resolutions that guide how the work is, is moving forward is, is a key element that fits under the First Nations Health Council's responsibilities and mandate. The legal obligations and service delivery responsibilities are the pieces that we're developing and growing in terms of the First Nations Health Authority. We have to have the ability and capacity to take on all those pieces that fit there. Um, a good example of that, and it was a discussion that was part of a, a meeting I was in yesterday with some of the folks from Lake Babin. We're talking about dental, and we're talking about dental therapists. Now, dental therapists are a, um, a mechanism put in place by the federal government that, that are able to operate in BC only through the authority and powers of the federal government. When the First Nations Health Authority comes into play, we won't have that situation. And without the federal government running dental therapists, we won't be able to do that in, in BC. So the dental therapists aren't recognized in the province of British Columbia at this point in time in the dental area. So what will happen is that Health Canada will continue to provide that service for us in British Columbia until we find a solution. So those are the kinds of things in terms of legal obligations and authorities that, that we have to um, kind of work our way through one issue at a time and we'll examine and are currently examining all the clinical services provided by Health Canada to understand what issues happen when we take it over and how we're going to uh, ensure business continuity so that we don't deplete services moving forward. And a lot of that discussion and planning in terms of what the final outcomes will be will be part of the engagement discussion around transformation that will happen after, um, after transition. I, I think one of the pieces I should have, um, I can go back, go back too far, just going back to this time frame, is that in the transition period, partway through transition, there will be a transfer date, which is April 1, 2013. So the transfer date is not the conclusion of the transition period. The transfer date is when we officially take responsibility, but still working in partnership with Health Canada and the province of British Columbia, we're then going to be feeling the weight of operating the Fini BC regional operations with the headquarters uh, functions that we're taking on and the uh, regional corporate functions that we're putting in place to support all the operations across the board. So transition is a time that um, will continue after, after transfer date the transformation period, as we discussed, um, is going to be sometime in the future and won't take place until engagement is, has, has been undertaken with nations across the province. I think another um, area here that is important to, to look to is that with the First Nations Health Authority, there's going to be a number of things, and it was mentioned uh, in the previous discussion, we are going to ensure that as we build the First Nations Health Authority, we're going to look at the notion of establishing standards for health programs. It was talked about earlier how that will be done with the First Nations leadership and health leaders across the province. 
We have to also make sure we're fiscally responsible and that we're accountable, accountable to First Nations people. We will have a funding agreement with Health Canada that will set out some accountabilities there, but the primary responsibility will be to the First Nations communities in British Columbia. We're now looking at um, accreditation and looking to ensure that we are going to be operating at a high standard as per Directive 7 and we'll be looking to try and achieve some of the similar kinds of accreditations that some of our communities have, uh, three corners included, that was recognized the other day. So implementing the streams of work, just a bit of discussion on the process. As people may be aware, the, um, the framework agreement talks about creating an implementation committee that's responsible for the implementation plan of, of the entire framework agreement. And so the framework agreement really contains, in my view, four streams of work. On the, on the far side, you see provincial partnerships. Really, in, that, in my mind, that's the health actions agenda. That's the work we do with the province, first of all, to build the governance relationships, like what's happening through the regional tables and the accords that are going to be, that have been signed and will be signed. But in addition to that, there's a lot of work going on with the ministry and its, its folks and, and, and the creation of um, health actions uh, strategy tables that are trying to ensure the tripartite collaboration exists to address the health actions were identified in the plan. So you'll have an opportunity to hear about those areas tomorrow as, as tomorrow's agenda will focus on health actions. In terms of the, the transition work and the Health Canada pieces, um, the conclusion of, of sub-agreements is a key part. Um, it was mentioned, uh, Warner was mentioning the human resources, health benefits, records transfer and information management information sharing, um, assets and software, accommodations, capital planning, and First Nations health facilities and, and contribution agreements. So a number of very key important sub-agreements that will enable the transfer of the federal pieces into the First Nations health authority. So we work together uh, with the chair and deputy chair of the health council on those discussions for the preparation of legal agreements that the First Nations health authority board of directors will need to be signing on to at the end of the day. The transition um, stream of work is, is more of an operational level discussion that we're having around the actual mechanics of moving something from point A to point B. And in each of those sub-agreement areas, there's a lot of considerations for what it takes to actually implement an accommodation agreement or a health benefits agreement or any of the agreements that we talked about. So I think it's um, really a, uh, a problem solving, if you will, and, and in ensuring that uh, the quality will be there day one in terms of the, uh, the area of work that we'd be talking about. The Interim Management Committee is, is the opportunity where myself as a CEO uh, meets with the Regional Director on a weekly basis to talk about um, what's happening in the region. And we talk about a number of things. One, first and foremost is I'm always concerned about the money and trying to understand um, how we're doing in relation to what we negotiated to what the region's actually spending today to ensure that we're still ahead of the game. And it's been an interesting discussion, especially with Deficit Reduction Action Plan that came out in um, the beginning of this fiscal year for the, for the, um, uh, the federal government. And as you know, the government of Canada has made its cuts and announced those cuts across the board, and we're, um, we're able to, to secure what we have in our agreement. So we're very fortunate to have that and that we're outside of, of the deficit reduction and the implications of that, though, are still being felt in terms of the work that we need to do to to have the transfer of FINI come across because a lot of the other supporting departments that I talked about, headquarters and others, um, are, are being affected. And so the people that are there that are to work with us are, are working through the Deficit Reduction Action Plan as well as the transfer of the FINI BC region and the, uh, and the appropriate headquarters and regional corporation functions to the First Nations Health Authority. So we're working through those challenges moving forward in a good way to ensure that we can meet our April 1 deadline. The um, other pieces of interim management committee I think that are important is that we, you know, we talk about the region, we talk about the work in communities, uh, we talk about the kinds of issues that um, the regional office is hearing from communities and whether or not they can successfully address those issues. It gives us a sense of understanding the challenges that Health Canada has today operating within the policy and, and, and mandate structure that it has. And it uh, also gives us an opportunity to see where we can make improvements moving ahead. A lot of discussion too that we have around the um, existing staff complement in Health Canada and trying to ensure that we are able to 
have effective communication and dialogue with the employees that are currently employed with Health Canada, Finney, BC region that are coming across so that we can ensure a, a solid level of uh, business continuity and service provision to our communities on day one. So, um, I must have jumped. Did I jump? I did jump. No, I didn't. No, it's not. Okay, I was um, just uh, in, in terms of transition priorities, it's, it's um, when you sort of think about how, how things work. And um, our, our big challenge here, where you sort of see in the, in the little, little comic strip, is, is how difficult it is if we spend too much time planning and that the actual advancement of things gets beyond where we are in our planning stages. So it's, it's kind of interesting because with this piece of work that we're doing, there's so many areas where we need good plans, but a lot of times you just got to roll up our sleeves and get down and do it. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting balance between meeting the April 1 date that we put in front of us ensuring that we do due diligence to make sure that it's actually workable and sustainable and then and then meeting all the other demands that we have in front of us so it, it um it's important to recognize that the transition process can be challenging but uh, that we're going to manage it the best that we can so when we we look at some of the priorities the things that we're talking about is to ensure that on day one first and foremost we can provide the money to communities that that communities have in the contribution agreements that they'll have in place that will then be held by the, the First Nations Health Authority. We have to ensure there's no service disruption across the board. We have to make sure that the people are in place, uh, whether they're staff that we will have that are providing services in community, or that um, the partnerships and arrangements are in place, that services are happening across the board the way that they are today at a minimum. We have to be able to pay our staff um, so that our people are, are comfortable as employees in the organization and can focus on the work of providing good service to the communities and our people regardless of where they live in the province. And we have to look to, as we can, improve operations and services where practicable through trans transition. So sometimes there will be areas where we can make improvement that really isn't a major transformation of a program or services, but it's an operational efficiency or something. It reduces maybe the uh, reporting burden or, or the way that the money flows or things like that that can help make things easier on the ground. So, um, jumping around a little bit because the PowerPoint up there is a little different than the one that I have in front of me. So, we will improvise. So, um, this was a, a snapshot of the current First Nations Health Authority organization. And by that, I mean this is the one post, um, post October signing of the framework agreement. The, the organization that we were, um, the the organizational design that we're using to help us move through transfer. So you look at a number of the areas around corporate services and implementation support, finance, um, human, um, human resources and, and administration support and, and so on and so forth. Uh, when you look across the board, we have an area that, that will cover communications and community engagement and, and, and those important pieces of work that we have, the policy planning and strategic initiatives areas where the health actions fits and the um, information management, information technology is, is really where we're um, looking at our, our current operations systems and so on. So it's interesting when you think about, and for those who have followed the history of the First Nations Health Society, that prior to that, um, as you know, we were housed in the First Nations uh, Summit Society organization, and from there became the operational arm of the council, and so um, from there um, had uh, the Chief's Health Committee team become part of our team and so on. And so we really started what I would describe as more of a mom and pop type operation. A shop that was really small. I was very um, working towards um, um, moving the implementation of the health plans forward, but also acknowledging the, uh, the words of the leadership around not wanting to get caught up in, in building a bureaucracy um, in, in advance of the work. So. But now what's happening with the creation of the First Nations Health Authority is we're starting to look at the transfer. So you see that we're talking about now bringing into this mom and pop shop all federal um, uh, First Nations programs and services. We're talking about the 240 some odd contribution agreements and over 100 contracts that they operate. We're talking about the 250 plus FTEs that may be coming over as part of this. So you're thinking about this little mom and pop shop that's got to grow up really fast. 
and, and with that in mind, you can think about, um, you know, we're currently running through a number of um, growth challenges, if you will, as an organization. And one of the things that I keep reminding my team whenever we address them is that we are building a First Nations health organization. So what does that mean to us in, re in, in, in context of all those plans that we talked about earlier and the work that we need to do in partnership with our communities moving forward. So that's um, always in the forefront of my mind as a CEO and as we look at this growth and development that's going to be happening by April 1, 2013, we've uh, got a lot of work to do to make sure that the, uh, the framework of this organization is, is solid and that it will reflect First Nations values and traditions and learnings and the governance that First Nations are putting around it. So when we talk about key transfer activities, as I was mentioning before, so systems and structures are really important for us. We're, we're building um, the First Nations Health Organization at an operational level. Um, the IMIT systems, financial systems, and HR systems, are, for example, are really important. Currently, the First Nations Health Society had been operating about 10 systems to support all of our activities in the organization. Health Canada has that we need to consider over 40, 45, 50 systems that support all of their operations and the things that they do in terms of their functionality. Um, we have areas of systems that support a mom and pop shop, but that aren't quite ready to support, uh, for example, the, the, uh, the volume of contribution agreements or the HR capacity that's going to be required moving ahead. So we're working very diligently on addressing those issues moving ahead. Um, Another key area, I think, is you know when we start talking about the assets and the real property and accommodations issues, uh, when you think about the various pieces, right now we have uh, you know our, our staff located in the Black Tower in, in West Vancouver. So we're all in one building. Health Canada, when we look at the accommodation issue, uh, we talk about their facilities in Vancouver. We talk about their facilities um, across the province where they have nursing stations and other things. All of those currently operate on a Health Canada network. We won't be using that network when we take over. We have to have our own network. Uh, in addition to that, we're talking about regional offices. We want to make sure that our, our regional offices are connected into our network so we can share information. And eventually, we want to work with and ensure that as, much, as many of the communities and the community health centers are connected into that network. So it's a big job, uh, one that's in front of us moving forward over the next, next years ahead of us. But at, at day one, we have to have a, a minimum requirement in terms of our, our technology and our systems so that we can operate as a corporate entity on our own. So financial and human resource systems as well are, um, as I mentioned, uh, need to be scalable to the volume of, uh, of the work that we're going to have in front of us with um, probably in total around 300 employees and um, the operating budget that's identified in the uh, framework agreement uh, for 20, uh, 2013, I think, is about $380 million. So that's a lot larger than what we're doing today. The um, program pieces that come along, and this is where I was talking some, in some areas about the clinical services and ensuring that we understand the impact and that we have a way of ensuring business continuity across the board. Um, dealing with the contribution agreements and honoring the commitments to communities is extremely important as well. So these are what we sort of identify around the key, key activities around transfer. And so, you know, keeping in mind that um, there are legal issues around all of these things, confidentiality issues in terms of accessing and holding information that Health Canada currently holds. The records transfer itself, I think, is, is fairly incredible in terms of Health Canada's records that they've accumulated over the years and what happens to them. How do we house them? Which ones do we need? Uh, will they continue to house them and provide them to us when we need them and so on? So keeping in mind that what's been um, put in place to enable this is a $17 million one-time implementation fund. So for the most part, you know, we're looking at um, how we're going to cover the idea of this transfer with that fund looking at building these systems, looking at ensuring we are going to be operational day one, making sure that we can, if we have to, look at our own financial system, that we can build it ourselves, and that'll cost money. Um, if Health Canada can provide a system to us, and the question then becomes, do we have the, the, um, 
the platform that it will run on, and we've got to build that piece. So there's always pieces that we have to be worried about. Um, there's also the um, discussions that need to go on around the legal agreements and so on that have to be taken care of, as well as this kind of engagement that um, is important in guiding the work moving forward. So here's a quick snapshot of uh, the year one uh, budget that we're talking about. And as you can see, most of it is designed in a way that will support uh, community programs and, and health plan implementation. So the, the, the monies that are there, um, you know, include the community regional program monies that are, that are committed to, um, that will be honored in terms of the agreement that communities has, the non-insured health benefits program, uh, the, the sunsetting programs that um, were programs that used to be like the, the uh, Youth Suicide Prevention Program, the uh, Aboriginal Diabetes Initiative, um, those programs from that upstream investment initiative a number of years ago that had a very short-term renewal are now going to be permanent programs for us in terms of the monies that are there and our ability to design programs moving ahead. The monies you see for capital projects in community are there. Um, we've got money in here for the tripartite plan, which is supporting the health actions work as well as um, the work moving forward on, on, on the implementation of the governance structure. So those pieces are all there and, and most of the budget is identified that way, uh, around 93% based on this diagram. You can see some of the other pieces that are kind of the pieces that are supporting us from the headquarters and the regional operations to ensure that the health authority itself can work well in terms of its own internal operations. Obviously up above you also have um, you know, the, the delivery mechanism in terms of uh, staffing and those kinds of things, some of which programs are run out of the, um, currently the FINI operations and others that are programs that are devolved to communities. So that's all in the above piece. So, so now we're um, going back to the, a bit of the discussion on the uh, partnership um, pieces that go on with this this work that we have in front of us. So it's really imperative to understand that the, um, the partnership piece for us starts with how we work with our communities. And, and I was really happy that um, the, the doctors were agreeable to do the, the doc talk yesterday and, um, and, and look at the introduction of the wellness, health and wellness model that um, the First Nations Health Authority folks have been developing over the years based on the input, what we've heard from community and what we hear and learn from other places as well. And that um, there's a real opportunity for this health authority to be very different than other health authorities in the province of British Columbia. And one that's responsive not only to our people and has the ability to leverage the acute care system in terms of ensuring that the province working with us is providing the quality of service that our people need when, when we need the acute care system, but a really strong focus on the ability to look at the, um, the wellness perspective and look at the wellness indicators that make sense to us. And to bring the, the, um, the, the uh, I guess, the notion of the individual responsibility forward, that we each have an individual responsibility for our own health and wellness journey, and that the First Nations Health Authority wants to be a partner to each and every one of us in ensuring that we can be successful in that journey as best we can be. So I think that that, that gives us a, a unique place to be and one where the actually the uh, provincial system, I think, and, and many of the doctors that I've spoken to are, are quite excited about the opportunity that we have in front of us and their, um, their opportunity to, to partner with us to make that a reality. The um, First Nations Health Authority will have also, I think, you know, a strong focus on taking a First Nations population health approach. Um, so we, and we will look to do that um, beyond what Fini used to do and look at it from a First Nations population perspective regardless of where our people live, whether we're at home or not at home, uh, that First Nations Health Authority wants to be able to partner with everyone and that we want to leverage our partnership with the federal and provincial governments to support everyone wherever they live. Um, the, the work around the partnership around leveraging the provincial system, I think, is really interesting because the transformation of health services across the province of British Columbia is something that's in the forefront of the provincial government's mind as they tackle their own challenges and issues around the sustainability of their health care system and how it interfaces with British Columbians. Um, the collaboration that we have you know, with regional health authorities to coordinate and integrate programs and services, 
moving forward, we'll work in support of what the regional tables are looking to do through your accords. We will look to improve access to physicians, to um, implement e-health technologies to help provide options and, and more efficient service delivery where possible. And, and, when, uh, and also looking at the integrated primary care piece, which is critical in terms of um, um, both of those pieces I just mentioned, but ensuring that we have the care we need on the ground. We also, you know, bring to the table discussions and learnings that we take from our, our friends in Alaska. In particular, in terms of primary health care, uh, primary care, we, we talk a lot about the model in, in Alaska, the Nutka system of care that South Central Foundation delivers. And so it really presents a, a model that I think works well for the indigenous people in, in Alaska that, that access that service, and one that could be um, a model that we may learn from in terms of what our model of care in terms of primary care looks like on the ground moving forward. There's a lot of work that we need to do to continue to do with the senior executive from the Ministry of Health to improve access to services. So the health authority works to, to meet with the executive, the ADMs and the others out of the ministry in Victoria to try and ensure that um, their work overall fits with what we're trying to do. And as you already know, there's the tripartite committee on First Nations Health where the, uh, the health authority um, co-chairs with the federal and provincial partners at a senior level and the health council and the health, our health directors as well as the CEOs of each of the health authorities and Dr. Perry Kendall's office as well as represented at the table to talk about implementing the health plan. So we have several avenues there to move ahead. We also continue to work and focus on our ongoing partnership with the federal government moving forward and learning to understand the impact of the deficit, deficit reduction action plan as well as the new direction that the Health Canada folks are bringing to delivery of health care for First Nations people across the province and how we remain a partner in that discussion and ability to leverage new initiatives moving forward is, is one of the goals in that area. Um, the innovation and change agenda is something I think that um, the province has that I think is really important for us to think about. The, this is a, a diagram that they have on their HealthLink BC site and it talks about how they're trying to change their system. It, it talks about things um, that are important to how the province sees itself moving forward. And what we've been doing with the tripartite plan from a First Nations perspective is aligning our commitments and goals in our tripartite health plan with each of these areas in the, um, in the transformation and change agenda that the province is working towards. And so this, this approach by the province informs, um, identifies key result areas that inform their expectations of their health authorities. We're working to ensure that we align those commitments with our commitments in the tripartite plan so there are no excuses, that there are no mixed messages that the tripartite health plan is a priority and a common thread through this entire health system. And so it's, it's an important piece of work that's starting to really, I think, take shape and I'm hoping that as health actions continues to move forward and as communities engage in some of those discussions, you'll start to see the opportunity for change on the ground. So uh, talking about the development of the health authority, we're, we're looking to ensure, as I mentioned, to be a responsive health authority, one that is, is in fact, um, as I've heard and, and as you've seen in the videos, a health authority that belongs to BC First Nations people. So we have the opportunity to work together to define what that means. And we need to make sure that we don't just pay that lip service, but it becomes a reality and that this health authority is responsive to the First Nations people in this province, but also that the notion of reciprocal accountability fits in there so that we really collectively are part of a First Nations um, health partnership, if you will, working together to address the health issues of our people regardless of where they live in this province. So we will each have respective roles in that and we'll have accountabilities to one another to make that work well. So there's things that the health authority can do from a population health perspective in support of communities and there'll be services that communities will be delivering directly on the ground for people that are within your service area, if you will. And there are going to be other areas of the province where your people will be residing that will be looking to find other mechanisms to ensure and support them in their health and wellness journey. So, um, I need to, um, oh, it's, it's okay. so, so I, I think we're looking to 
Um, see, my, my problem is, is I, I didn't bring my glasses up, and now that this is different, I can hardly read that. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, okay. So those are my glasses. But now I can't read my page. Oh, yeah, so there we go. Damn, that's embarrassing. Oh, well, but um, so the, the idea of, of the characteristics of the First Nations Health Authority, so responsive, established standards for health programs, fiscally responsible, accountable, and accredited. So as I mentioned earlier, those pieces are coming forward in a way that we want to make sure are done, that um, from an accreditation point of view on the bottom, as I mentioned, um, starting discussions with folks like Accreditation Canada to see how we can move forward in those areas, and those will be similar to communities who have started that work as well. And, and looking to understand what those standards should be and how, what makes sense for us. Fiscally responsible and accountable is, is something that we need to be um, to both our people, First Nations communities and nations across the province, as well as the government of Canada and British Columbia. And so it'll be an interesting discussion about um, what that looks like and how we move it ahead. But I think it's definitely um, you know, an opportunity for us to demonstrate that having control over the resources that we can have better outcomes than when the government held them for us. Establishing standards for health programs, um, Gwen was mentioning that and I think has, you know, in terms of how that should be done and how nations should be driving that agenda and what that looks like is really going to be important moving forward, especially as we transform these programs in a way that's directed by First Nations people. Responsiveness is, is just something to ensure that we're always timely in terms of how we do things and responsive in the way that makes sense. So how we do our work, um, purposeful, never losing sight of the seven directives. To us, that's extremely important. The work at Gathering Wisdom last year for us in British Columbia from a health perspective is historic. The seven directives that come out of it are planted in the forefronts of all of our minds and as Gwen or someone was trying to get, you know, we should be able to list them one after another on a daily basis because they really are, and as Doug talks about the consensus paper with those directives being the Bible, it's extremely important that we all always have those in the forefront of our mind. And the First Nations Health Authority is no different. We need to work uh, within those seven directives and be guided by what it tells us. I think a big part of this in terms of um, making decisions is that the interim First Nations Health Authority, as we go into transformation, will try and make available the best information and expertise possible as we talk about redesigning programs and services. And that, that can look at a number of different things. I think there's um, one, of the, one of the messages I wanted to have conveyed with folks yesterday with our, our doc talk was just that with doctors that we can work with doctors differently than what we're used to. We don't need to just think we need to see doctors and that doctors are only concerned to see us when we're sick. Doctors also have an interest in ensuring that we live well and that it's a new partnership that we want to create because the, the other way of doing it just doesn't work for us. And so we've got to find a better way. So doctors being part of our team and that want to come at it and embrace the model of wellness that we're talking about, I think we'll come at it at a way that will provide good information to our discussions so that nations can make their decisions and provide their direction that we need to transform programs and services. The other part around it is going to be data. We need good information to indicate to you what's happening today and what's happening in the future as we transform programs and services to be able to tell whether or not what we're doing is making a difference. And that'll be important for us to understand as a population. So it gives us the opportunity to grow and learn together and I think that's really important that um, we talk a lot about this transition that we're doing with Health Canada and the new health partnerships that we have with, with BC and with Canada and that this hasn't been done before. There isn't really a roadmap there that shows exactly what it looks like or how it should work. And there's nothing that tells us how well it will perform. So we have to learn about that together. We have to be able to sit and understand that, you know, we're doing the best we can. We're all evolving, moving forward. We won't make mistakes, but we're going to get up and keep going. I think that's really important. So as, as said, these are the seven directives. They, um, they provide the, the guidance to the work moving forward for the First Nations Health Authority as we create this organization. And in my mind, these are the things that help resonate with, with our team around what makes us a First Nations Health Organization that belongs to BC First Nations. Well, first and foremost is we live to these directives. These directives guide how we are and who we are. In addition to that, there's been some work done by the Health Council, the Health Directors Association, 
and the, um, at that time the Health Society, which is now the Interim Health Authority, on a set of common values. And so these values are on the board now, respect, discipline, relationships, culture, excellence, and fairness. And so there's a, a definition statement with each of those values that the three organization, the three members of this governance family have, have come up with to guide how we are collectively as a three. And those guide the interim First Nations Health Authority in terms of us as an organization as well. And then as we move ahead, we'll be drafting our own corporate values and, and some of these um, thoughts are up here now in terms of what they will look like moving forward to ensure that, um, again, we are a First Nations health organization and we align ourselves in terms of a way of working that makes sense to the, the higher level values that we receive and, and that we represent our values on a day-to-day -day basis. We're also looking to develop operational principles. And so this slide here is, is some work done at South Central Foundation and how they develop their operating principles using the word relationships to guide how they move their work forward. And it is really important that as they talked about the things that they do at an operational level have to, have to be guided by these principles, have to meet what's been set out in the principles. And we'll be doing a similar exercise as we move forward and form the First Nations Health Authority. But our, our goal in my mind is to use the word wellness because we can't forget the model that we presented yesterday and we look forward to your input and the day that that model becomes our model. So right now it's, it's our proposal and it's the one that we're looking for feedback on from everyone in this room and our nations so that we can confirm it as our First Nations health and wellness approach in the province that will then guide the work of the First Nations Health Authority as well as our provincial and federal partners when talking about First Nations health. So at this point in time, these principles are not identified, uh, but they will be moving forward as part of the next pieces of work that we have internally in building our operation. So in closing, just a few things, you know, talking about, again, reassuring that our, go our goal is to ensure that the transition process proceeds in a good way based on the seven directors and our collective values. And until transfer day, we're clear Health Canada maintains decision-making and service delivery responsibilities over current areas of responsibility. Yusuf and I talk about those responsibilities a lot and we're batting them back and forth to make sure that he, um, he, doesn't, um, he does what he needs to do to keep things moving forward in a good way. The Health Authority will continue to implement the Health Actions Agenda and achieve system transformation today. I think the discussions you'll have, be able to participate in tomorrow will give you a sense of where some of that work is going. And it's been a lot of work getting to the place where, where those tables are in terms of a tripartite collaboration which now fully needs to be realized through a First Nations decision-making process, which will involve the engagement process that the Health Council is talking about, and the regional tables and the regional agreements and so on. So there's a lot of work to connect the dots, but it's come a long way in, in the number of years that we've been working at it. And the Health Authority will define the wellness model approach um, launched yesterday and look to continue its role as as, as your wellness partner, we have to ensure that um, you know we're there, we have a way of supporting each and every one of us as we take on our individual responsibilities for our own health and wellness journey, that the First Nations Health Authority has the ability to support you where you're at with that journey, wherever you're at, and wherever you're located in the province of British Columbia. So a lot of what I'm looking for in terms of feedback is what does that look like for people on the ground? What kinds of things can we do in terms of, first of all, is the model right? And then once the model's right, what kinds of things can we do to support communities on the ground? Tools that you need to enable you to work with your folks and that we are a partner to, to your organization, your community and your people on their individual health and wellness journeys. So we'll have to figure that out moving forward and that's exciting work, I think, moving ahead for all of us. So lastly, you know, looking at, um, it's about our collective efforts that will result in health improvements at individual community, region and population health level. I think there's an extremely important opportunity where we've been working at health for, for many, many years now in a way that's been um, dictated by the federal government. And a lot of times that's created um, uh, very challenging situations in terms of our, our inability to work together. But now we've created a space where, where we can change that. And it's up to us to determine what that looks like and how we get there to ensure that we, we make the most of what we have in front of us and we, we, we um, share what we have and we work together in terms of our resources and our knowledge and our expertise to ensure that we can do the job that's in front of us. So I look forward to continuing the work in this area and, and really 
in my mind, I'm focused on, on April 1, 2013, and always, I know all of us keep pictures like this in our own mind about our future. And our future is as bright as we make it as leaders here today, taking on this responsibility. So I really thank everyone for coming out. It's really a good opportunity to see the interest that we have in this health plan and the importance of the work that we have in front of us. And I think as long as we keep our, our, our vision in mind of our, our young people and where we want them to be in the future, and that at this point in life, they are well. We want them to stay well all through their lives, and that's the goal moving forward. So thank you very much.